Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all here. I'm Erika Zellini, and along with Celio Costa, I'll be the host for this session. We both are members of the Wiki Movimento Brasil user group. We are located in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and we are honored to have in this session such location and language diversity to show to you. We have here at least three very different time zones, which was a bit challenging to coordinate, but totally worth it. So the initial idea was to gather on a single session cool people from the Global South working on modeling projects on Wikidata and with bibliography and libraries, so very ambitious. Then Thomas Schaffer recommended us to talk to Peter Murray Rust and his team from Open Virus based in India, and we are glad we did it. So soon we realized that that would be better to split into sessions. So now you'll get to know the diverse team from Open Virus plus some interfaces with Latin America and Indonesia. And later today, Sally and I will be back with another session on structuring Wikidata projects. So this one will be held 75% of the time in Portuguese and 25% of the time in Spanish. I think it will work out well. So please, even if those aren't your first languages, you're welcome to join us and get to know these projects. Um, I don't want to make this introduction too long, but say thank you is never enough. So I just want to say thank you to the speakers in advance. I'm sure we'll uh, learn a lot from them. And I also want to thank to the week side committee that approved under the e-scholarship modality that Sally and I ran those two sessions. And a special thanks to Leon Wyatt that have been supporting us since the beginning. So the idea was to bring Global South Voices to the conference under these themes. And I believe that Wikisite is all about language diversity as well after all. So now some reminders. You can ask, ask questions or make comments directly through YouTube or the other pad that is available on the program. You can also comment via Twitter. And uh, Sally will be dealing with this and we'll let the speakers do their talk and open for questions and for discussions at the end. So without further ado, I'll bring the speakers to start the session. So please welcome Peter Murray Rust, Shuita Hedge, Prutri Vrajan, Diraj Dingani, Lakshmi Dev Priya, Vaishali Arora, Dr. Ambrin Hamadani, Ayush Garg, Ariana Benesel Garcia, Pruti Vrajan, Dizapta Ivan Irwan. And please correct me if I mispronounce any of your beautiful names and let's have fun with it, okay? So please, I'll bring the first one that is Peter. And uh, so, I'll share your screen. <laughs> excellent. So this is a wonderful meeting and uh, greetings to everybody. Um, this is not my show. This is uh, me helping a number of people I know to present uh, their message to the world. Um, uh, I'm at the University of Cambridge, but I also run a nonprofit called Content Mine. Uh, and uh, here you can see that uh, six years ago we visited Brazil for Open Science Meeting. Maybe you can recognize some of the people. And I want to say that Brazil. Uh, and other Latin American countries are doing a wonderful job in uh, fighting for open. Uh, and you will see later uh, what um, uh, Ariana uh, has to show from Mexico. But this is your show, and I hope that we can support you in this endeavor. Uh, I was very involved in developing content mining, and six years ago, uh, my colleague Jenny Malloy visited Gita Yadav in Delhi, uh, and this was a meeting that we held uh, over the internet six years ago. Uh, Gita uh, and uh, Jenny are plant sciences, uh, and uh, so this concentrated on the chemistry of plants, um, and Gita and I have been running a project for uh, six years on that. Now, why does it matter? About seven years ago, there was a major epidemic of uh, Ebola virus in Liberia. And uh, this was predicted, sorry, I go back. Uh, 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 this was predicted in the um, scientific literature, but it was hidden behind a paywall. Uh, this message was very clear that uh, here's the paper. It still costs $31. Uh, it's 40 years old, 
but it says very clearly that Ebola and Liberia are linked. And so simple text mining of the sort that we have developed in content mine is capable of liberating this. So the simple message here is we are searching papers in the scholarly literature for the things we are interested in, diseases, viruses, countries, and so on. And we are very grateful to uh, Wikimedia, who supported us with a grant in 19, uh, 2017 to develop content mine uh, version of this we called Wikifact Mine. Uh, and uh, in this, we developed dictionaries. So the concept is dictionaries uh, of terms that we can search the literature with. Um, and we have de been developing it since then, and we are going to show you this today. We took this idea to India in uh, a year and a half ago. Here is Gita again and me in Delhi. And these are some wonderful collaborators in this workshop. And we built dictionaries for rice, millets, and maize, because these are the crops that were particularly concerned for food security. This is a food security uh, program. I've also got the great privilege to know um, Anasuya Sengupta, who uh, for many years uh, worked with Wikimedia uh, and was the grant making um, officer. She has now got a Shuttleworth Fellowship uh, and she has developed a project called Whose Knowledge? And Whose Knowledge is uh, to amplify marginal voices uh, in the world and to decolonize uh, the internet. And that is a theme which this session is going to show to you, uh, marginalized voices and decolonization and particularly the global south. So um, what you're going to see in this program is some of our um, collaborators. Uh, you're going to have a presentation from the Open Virus team. Uh, you're going to see Ariana showing uh, the Redelic server in um, Mexico. Uh, and we've invited Dasap to, to talk about Indonesia archive. Uh, so another um, language from the global south. And we also asked Daniel Meachin to tie this together using uh, Wikimedia Scholarly. Scholia. I don't know whether Daniel can join us, but um, uh, we will finish with a discussion on how we bring all of this together under the uh, Wikimedia um, uh, umbrella. And uh, so our goal is to unite the Wikimedia technology to honor inclusion, equity, and diversity. Uh, and we have an etherpad open. And if you have any questions and ideas, please add them to that. But I will now hand over to Shweta Hector, who is doing a brilliant job of coordinating um, uh, this meeting. So over to Shweta. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Erica, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that. I'm Shweta. I'm an undergraduate from India, as well as science communicator for the team Open Virus. Thank you, Eric and Celio, for organizing such a wonderful session. It's a pleasure to be here at Wikisite. And it's also so nice that we are demonstrating how important Wikimedia, uh, Wikidata has been to our project, as well as for the science as a whole on its eighth birthday. So the rest of the talk is going to have the following outline. First, I will go over how we built our team. Next, um, I will also briefly talk about the architecture and the overview of the project. And the team members are now later going to discuss more about the project, that, uh, about the project, the science that we do, and the technicalities of it. And finally, we will have a discussion which will lead into Wikimedia. So let's get started. 
there is a huge influx in the number of uh, papers, scientific publications that are coming out, um, and more so as COVID-19 hit. Unless um, the data in it is structured and the uh, papers are annotated and aggregated, there is little the world can do about it. Therefore, there is no simple way for citizens or even researchers to get proper insights from the open literature. So this initial realization led Dr. Peter Marirast and other global volunteers to start with endeavors like this. They started with open climate knowledge earlier this year, but when the pandemic hit, they decided to use the same technology that they use for open climate knowledge to tackle viral epidemics. And that's how open virus started. It started with two interns along with Dr. Peter Marirast and Dr. Geeta Yadav. Geeta Yadav is a lecturer at the University of Cambridge and also a group leader at NIPGR, as Peter already mentioned. So our team began five months ago, and gradually, as time passed, we were joined by more and more interns, uh, talented individuals who have contributed immensely to the project. And in the middle, we were also joined by Karya interns um, from Rajasthan, India, which was really great. And recently, we participated in Cambridge Bioinformatics Hackathon, wherein we were joined by many other global volunteers um, to the team. And we always welcome more people to join us, especially Wikimedians. So um, as you can already tell, our team is very diverse. We've got bioscientists, we have now have computer scientists as well. We've also got a high school student and so on. Most of us have access to laptops, but some of them only have phones, but still together we are able to do science. Our team, even though we work virtually, is built upon collaboration, inclusivity, diversity, and equity. One amazing part about our project is that we do all of our work in the open. All of the work that we do is available on our GitHub page, including our progress reports too, which we update in real time. We have also been able to live stream one of our um, you, um, meet lab meetings online which is available on this link um, and we've also given several outreach talks at various platforms which is available um, on this link and also this link is available on an ether pad as well so as the team grew we divided ourselves into eight mini projects each of them um, working on a specific facet of viral epidemics so we've got many pro uh, uh, eight mini projects, that is viral epidemics and countries, viral epidemics and diseases, drugs in viral epidemics, active funders in viral epidemics research, non, the role of non-pharmaceutical interventions in viral epidemics, viruses in viral epidemics, the role of zoonosis in viral epidemics, and testing and tracing in viral epidemics. Some of our team members are going to discuss some of these mini projects in detail. Um, so how exactly do we extract knowledge from literature? In other words, what is the architecture of our project? Well, we've got three sort of puzzle pieces to the project. First, we've got the mini corpora. Second, we've got the dictionaries. And third, we've got the Amy. Let's actually look at them one by one. First, we've got mini corpora. So mini corpora is like a collection of scientific articles on a specific query. And we get them to many open repositories like European C repository, which has millions of open access uh, papers. Um, and um, uh, we, we use a tool called Get Papers, which helps us download hundreds of papers in minutes. Um, recently, we were able to collaborate with Ariana from Red Lake, and we'll hear more from her later. So uh, because of that collaboration, we now have um, a mini corpora in Spanish, which we, we, which we were able to annotate uh, with the help of the tools that we've built. And we would also like to extend this to many preprint servers in different languages as well. And all of the uh, mini corpora is downloaded on our local machines, and searches are run on our local machines. Okay, now the mini corpora is down. Next, we've got dictionaries. And this is where Wikidata comes in. We create our dictionaries with the help of Sparkle query, and we then run it through Amydict, the a tool that we've developed, and more about this later. We have our team members discussing this in detail. Uh, so to get a functional dictionary. So this is how a typical dictionary would look like. It, this is, um, um, you know, uh, dictionary of country facets so we've got uh, terms that is name of countries we've got wikidata id wikipedia url and so on we've got eight dictionaries corresponding to eight of our mini project and dictionaries are there to extract multidisciplinary knowledge about viral epidemics 
Um, most of these dictionaries were created directly from Wikidata's Bacal queries. One amazing thing about these dictionaries is that they're multilingual. And um, that means that multilinguality means that we can empower the global South as well as other underrepresented parts of the world. Um, the one good thing about using Wikidata is that it is very, very easy to introduce multilinguality to the system. OK, so now we've got mini copra and then we've got the dictionaries. What do we do with it? Well, that's where Amy comes in. Uh, with varieties of dictionaries, we can then annotate and classify the papers in the mini copra uh, with the help of Amy to get dashboards and co-occurrences as results. In other words, Amy takes in the mini copra uh, and it annotates it with the terms that we have given in the dictionary to give us dashboards which link back to Wikidata and Wikipedia. And it also um, gives us co-occurrences, frequencies, and much more. Amy search can also give us the main subject in a specific paper with the help of dictionaries. So this is sort of you know a brief overview of the project. And we can use further downstream tools like Jupyter Notebook R to you know, um, make further inferences from the result that we get from Amy Search. And this is what uh, is done by the team, especially in the last few months. So um, let's quickly talk about our inspiration. Well, our inspiration comes from Ranganathan, who is a father of global library science. Uh, we believe that repositories are for everyone, everywhere, and that knowledge should be free and accessible to all, irrespective of what they do or where they come from. One thing that I realized after joining OpenVirus is that the world is more connected than like never before. And we can break barriers of languages and countries to come together and do science for the greater good. With that, I would quickly like to thank the team, Dr. Peter Mareras and Dr. Geeta Anjali Yadav, uh, who has been amazing mentors. And it's always such a delight to work with this amazing team. With that, I would like to hand it over to the team to discuss more of the science that we do. And uh, they will have demonstrations, which I hope is going to be fun. Over to the team. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. So now we'll have here Rajan and Diraj. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Please share Amber in the screens. Just a second here. Ambrin, can you show his slides? Thank you. Hello, Hello my name is Dheeraj Dhingani. I'm from India, Rajasthan, India. I was connected with this team in July. Mein juda tha. ये हमारे यहाँ पे मतलब किसानगढ़ में इंटरनेट तो मतलब एक्सेस करना बहुत मुश्किल है इसका पता नहीं है कब आ रहा है कब नहीं आ रहा इस टीम के साथ जुड़ना मेरे मेरे लिए बहुत अच्छी बात है नेक्स्ट स्लाइड मेरे पास कंप्यूटर नहीं था मैंने अपने सारे काम अपने स्मार्टफोन पे किए हैं स्पार्कल एंड एनी अदर मैंने इस ओपन वायरस से काफी कुछ सी, चीजें सीखी है जैसे टीम की तरह कैसे काम करते हैं कंप्यूटर के बारे में क्या है कितनी नॉलेज है बाहर मतलब जिसे साइंटिफिक नॉलेज है जिसे हमको बढ़ाना है नेक्स्ट मैं इंट्रोड्यूस हुआ मतलब एक ओसन से कि मतलब नॉलेज इतनी ज्यादा है और मेरे पास कुछ भी नहीं है मैंने इस 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 इंटर्नशिप में डिक्शनरीज के बारे में सीखा भी कि डाटा और स्पार्कल कैसे यूज करते हैं और ये सब मैंने अपने आप ये पहली क्वेरी है जो मैंने यूज की थी और इसके रिजल्ट अगली अगली स्लाइड में ये रिजल्ट हैं इसमें मतलब सब चीज है विकी डाटा के विकिडाटा के आईडी, विकिपीडिया लिंक्स, डिस्क्रिप्शन, बहुत सारी चीजें। 
ये फर्स्ट मल्टी लैंग्वेज फर्स्ट मल्टी लैंग्वेज स्पार्कल क्वेरी है जो हमने क्रिएट की थी और इसके रिजल्ट अगली में इसमें इसमें दो लैंग्वेज है एक इंग्लिश एक स्पेनिश दैट्स ऑल थैंक्स Thank you, Dheeraj. We now have uh, Rajan, who is going to demonstrate how we use a uh, Wikidata Sparkle query to create dictionaries. Over to you, Rajan. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Pratap Rajan. I'm going to tell how we build multilingual dictionary by using uh, giving an example of item drug dictionary. So as Asweta said, this is going to be a multilingual. We use Wikidata Sparkle query for building a dictionary. And as coach multilingual, we do have languages such as Portuguese and South Indian languages such as Tamil, Sanskrit, Hindi, Urdu, and some other languages like German and Spanish, Portuguese too. So uh, this how the thing we use Wikidata Sparkle query to build dictionaries. So every Wikipedia items, everything has a unique item number. That is like every item has its unique code. So that is rep representative with, uh, with the term Q. Here's a two examples that I have shown you of two drugs. So in spite of building, like bringing all the drugs into one source of one command line, we found that this medication is a tag which has been like linked with instant of under the property. By using this property, we could fetch the data from the Wikipedia through Wiki data query service. So this is a typically multilingual query looks like. So this is going to be where the property, as I said earlier, the queue, which is instant that shows the query of that tags that have been linked of drugs, which is related to medications that is which have been used for the humans to, as in medicines. So this DP274, this property tells us the chemical formula because every drug has its own chemical formula and its own pictures. And the other property that's P117, which tells us these structures. So these are the typical labels, which labels have been determined for the particular language to extract them to we are telling that we need a label and their alternative label and the description of the particular language that can be like as it as it's mentioned it's in here hindi as this goes multilingual always we have to give and we have to provide a link or we have to give a referral where the word comes from so every uh, every draft and every molecule in this have been linked directly towards the wikipedia query so each language has its own wikipedia link so it direct it will read directly redirect to its own its own page as well and I'll be demonstrating how it works a bit later. So this will be an sparkle output of a multilingual dictionary. So you could find here that like you could find some, uh, you could find here that like it has been being multilingual. You could find Wikipedia links of terms in English. You could also find the as each drug has its many names, like it has its own IUPAC names and some other like local names into it. So we have been using alternative label to fetch all the related terms to of that drugs. And you could also find like multiple languages and their and their Wikipedia links here for that, which could go directly to their pages. So once we get an output, which we give a Sparkle endpoint and we directly download that into a local PC. Once we download this into a local machine, we directly give that we run a so any deck, which is a software which we build, and that directly converts into an ME format. ME format is nothing but that it is a, like it builds a dictionary with the help of Sparkle query, and which is directly help us to do ME search and go on with the further results. So I will. So now I'll be showing you the uh, how does the things work out here. So this is as I said, it's Wikidata. We are using Wikidata Sparkle query. So we are giving a select label that each Wikipedia, which Wikidata, Wikidata are nothing but a specific item that can be anything of your sorts. But here we are using drugs. So each drug has its own alternative name, the alternative name, Wikipedia link, and a uh, description in it, and format description. So as this goes multilingual, we have added several languages, 
uh, languages. There, those are nine languages, which I stated earlier. So these things we used to be running. So as I said, we have been added the property name and medication of property and, and the chemical formula and the chemical structure of the compound. So we have been added the Wikipedia links to get the fixed results from directly. And this goes like, it has like nine languages. This code runs nearly 45 lines. In meanwhile, if it takes a Sparkle query, which takes nearly a half a minute or one minute to get its results. So then in also, you can also re, you can also limit your searches depends upon your time. So it's, yes, like you could also find like there are 1,570 results, which I think fed, fetch within nearly a minute. So you can limit your service like as, as you need just 10 drugs or 10 results or 12 results you could add up here that is like limit and your term over here which limited your searches. So as results is getting down so let, let me tell between like explain you these things. So these uh, so the result will be something like you, you could be able to get your results and once you get this, we'll be using this. You could find your link. Once you click that link, there'll be option called download Sparkle endpoint. Once you end this Sparkle endpoint, you will be getting in your local PC. So make sure that you add like proper terms into it. And you could also like use a runner code or you could also check into it. So yeah, here are the results. So you could find here that like, as I said, like these are the results with the unique identifier, the molecular name, their English uh, Wikipedia links and their alternative labels and so on. And you could have find like many, uh, the identifier have been repeated in multiple times, which we, which we could visualize that like many South, in, like South Asian languages, people have not added like their language terms into it. So it is so hard to fetch up things which have been added. So it's directly given its property name. For this particular drug, we could have drugs in English, Spanish, and uh, German. So there are some drugs which has all the languages into it. This is how Sparkle Endpoint works. And once you have to, for downloading Sparkle Endpoint output, just click it over here and Sparkle Endpoint, just give an end, end results. And it just takes nearly a half a minute so to get downloaded in your local PC and you can directly redirect into MEDIC and further explore your dictionary. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rajan and Dheeraj. If anybody has got questions for both of them, please feel free to leave them on Etherpad. We now have um, Vaishali to talk about her mini project viral epidemics and funders. Over to you, Vaishali. Uh, thanks, Shweta. So, uh, hello, I am a graduate student at the uh, University of Delhi, India. And I'll uh, first let me share my screen. Is everything okay, Shweta? Okay, yes. you think so. All right. So I'll be talking about the passive uh, funders. The scientific question that we are asking here is uh, what organizations are most commonly mentioned in the viral epidemic uh, research literature? So this knowledge aims to extract information about funders all across the world and then uses this information to look through the scientific literature published on viral epidemics and gives an output in such a way that tells us the frequency of occurrence of each funder in a particular set of published article that we are calling as corpora. So uh, the foundation of this project involved uh, creating a dictionary, starting with first building a, a Sparkle query and uh, uh, Sparkle uh, resulted to get a list of all the funders across the globe as more funders, but many other things, uh, which uh, we are going to see in the subsequent slides. Uh, many other labels, such as uh, the country where they are based in, the type of funders they are, some were universities, private companies, world organizations, and uh, the their Wikipedia links. And uh, we got these results in a, uh, several milliseconds from uh, Sparkle. 
query in Wikidata. And these results were then uh, converted to uh, uh, ME, uh, converted through ME dictionary tool uh, through Sparkle map. And uh, we got uh, dictionaries. We use this, these dictionaries to, uh, to, uh, to get a fair idea about which uh, organizations are actually most actively mentioned in the uh, research uh, literature that we had. So we got the results in the form of HTML tables that uh, clearly mentioned that uh, which that this paper is talking about which funders actually. So uh, our initial results suggest that uh, the most active of them was uh, World Health Organization, followed by Center for Disease Control and Prevention, then Royal Society, National Institute of Health, and uh, we have not yet ascertained their role in every document. And uh, uh, next, we are planning to put these frequencies on the world map to make the results more understandable and clean. And here are the several links to our uh, GitHub repository and uh, on the facet funders. And uh, at last, I would like to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you so much, Vaishali. That was great. Now we have uh, Priya, Lakshadevi Priya, who is going to talk about her mini project, Viral Epidemics and Diseases. Over to you, Priya. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good, uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to discuss about the face of disease, uh, and it mainly deals with the comorbidity. That is, uh, a person who uh, uh, suffers with uh, simultaneously with two or more diseases. Uh, so uh, let's get in. Uh, does analyzing the comorbidity provides a solution to viral epidemics? Yes, it does. Uh, actually, we can uh, uh, we can. Um, know the sufferings of a patient while he's in uh, the viral epidemics and after suffering that is uh, his effects as well as the symptoms while he's undergoing the viral epidemics. So how we analyze the an annotated uh, comorbidities from the articles that uh, we use ME and for this particular comorbidities we use the disease dictionary. Of course this dictionary is created by Emetic and the Sparkle theory. But we have a special uh, feature is that we have the ICD-10 codes. And this ICD-10 codes are provided by the World Health Organization itself. So it was so easy with Sparkle Theory only to add these uh, ICD-10 codes in the disease dictionary. So we have a mini project which consists of the corpus as well as the dictionaries. And this corpus consists of the 950 PMCs from the Europe PubMed Central. And this is how our uh, primary dictionary looks like. It has the Wikidata ID, has the synonyms, and it has uh, the ICD-10 codes also. So uh, uh, if we run the, the, this dictionary on ME, using ME on the corpus, we get uh, data tables. And you can see, if we have a closer look, this or the these are the diseases that are mentioned in a particular PMC article. If I click as article, if I click one of these disease i'm redirected to the wikipedia page so and now we are trying to uh, redirect it to the wiki data page for more precision and we also got the coherence of of words from the document as uh, this plot and uh, let's have a closer look you can see we have uh, influenza chikungunya encephalitis and these are the diseases that are mentioned in the document and uh, we, we can see that these are the frequent diseases that are mentioned. Of course, this corpus is a non-COVID paper corpus. And so uh, we have no foreign, uh, we have the COVID or SARS viruses mentioned here. And this is the Sparkle file of the multilingual dictionary. Uh, we created a Sparkle theory in the, uh, for multilingual dictionary. And this is a Sparkle file downloader. As you can see here, we have Tamil, Hindi, which are the some of the Indic languages. And we have a closer look at the above. We have the ICD-10 codes, we have Urdu, Portuguese, and Spanish. So with the Sparkle file and with the help of this emedict command, we are able to create a multilingual dictionary. And we are hoping to get more, uh, more effective results from this multilingual dictionary. 
and now we are trying to refine our uh, ideas more and more and this uh, we are going to, uh, from the abdined um, amidict tables and the coherence laws we are now trying to plot the diseases with their frequencies in the specific region in a world map so uh, it, it will be easy for a user viewer and next we are going trying to, for the amidict uh, table data tables with multilingual besides english and also with the icd10 codes and we are trying to work out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priya. If anybody has got, uh, any questions for both of them, feel free to leave them on Etherpad. We now have Amreen Hamadani and Ayush Garg, who is going to talk about the uh, Jupyter Notebook endeavors that we've taken. We first have um, Amreen Hamadani, who is going to talk about her many projects, um, viral epidemics in country, as well as um, talk about her work. Over to you, Amreen. Hello, can you hear me? And can you see my screen? Yes, everything's working fine. Hello, can you can you all hear me? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. And you can, can you go. see my screen? Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Shweta. I'm here to give you a brief overview of our Jupyter notebooks, of our adventures with Jupyter. And also, uh, I'll be telling you about my mini project, Viral Epidemics and Countries. So why did we pick up Jupyter? Uh, is simply because it is a very nice platform to consolidate all our work, as well as to make it readable, as well as repeatable by anybody. Anybody can take up our work, read it, and reuse it in their local machines anywhere in the world. So uh, now I'm running this slideshow for our work. So why is the mini project Viral Epidemics and Countries important? So we all know that the WHO has often talked about variation in the quality of reporting systems across countries, which is due to differences in economic, social, cultural, or epidemiological factors. So, but we also know that the COVID-19 pandemic turned the world upside down and we realized that no country was ready for any kind of pandemic. Therefore, there is really a need for constant vigilance to understand patterns and, as Peter already told you, to mine literature to see whether there are certain predictions in the literature which could prevent as well as control viral epidemics today and forever. So, Mining scientific literature is a very important starting point because it will help us find answers to critical questions like epidemics are reported in which countries and which countries report epidemics with what frequency. And this will help us in preventing as well as controlling the viral epidemics in each country, nipping the evil at its bud and preventing the spread of these viral epidemics right from its epicenter. Now I move on to the actual uh, notebook. And this particular notebook is about the creation of a corpus and the creation of a dictionary. Like Shweta already has explained that the primary steps are the creation of a corpus and creation of a dictionary. And these two together help in running a research, which gives us many useful inferences. So the tool for, uh, uh, for creating the corpus or multiple corpora on our local machines is GetPaper which is a scraper for the Europe PMC database. Now, installation of get, uh, get papers is very simple. You only have to have Node.js installed on your PC first. So um, how do we install get papers? This is the requisite command. And you just have to run it on, right on the Jupyter notebook. And this is the kind of result you will get. And after we run, after we've installed uh, get papers, we can also, it's a very good idea to run help for, the, for that particular um, uh, system. And this is the kind of results you will get, and it'll show you all the various functionalities of get papers. Moving on, we can also set, uh, now if you want to run a particular query on get papers, for example, we want to install a few papers on our own machine, we can download thousands of papers on the local machine in minutes. So if you want to install uh, this particular, um, uh, you know, uh, if you want to install uh, a corpus of say suppose 95 papers and the query would be the topic we want to download papers on would be viral epidemics this is exactly what we would do we would also specify the 
uh, output directory on which we want to download all our papers. So this, these are essentially the variables we are going to set first, and then we are going to run the actual query, specifying the title of the search query, the output directory, and the formats. We will be downloading all papers that will be available there in full text format as well. And after that, we are done within minutes, we can actually ac access the corpus on our local machines. Now we move on to another very interesting part, the dictionaries. And we create dictionaries using Wikidata Sparkle. Rajan has, of course, demonstrated a lot of it. But we can bring all of that potential of Sparkle right into our Jupyter notebooks using the Sparkle wrapper, which can be imported into the Jupyter itself. And after we do that, we can actually specify our entire query here in Spark in, in Jupyter. Now, this particular query is uh, actually for getting all the ISO countries from uh, Wikidata and presenting them in a human readable format. For example, this one here, as you can see, it gets all the information regard with regards to the countries, its Wikidata link, its Wikipedia link, its ISO link, uh, all the synonyms of the dictionary of the countries, as well as its location coordinates. And after we have done that, we can simply save this in a uh, file, in a separate XML file. And then we can move on to actually using the Sparkle result within Amy. And how do we do that? For that, we first have to convert this Sparkle endpoint into a, an Amy readable format. So we install Amy using these commands. And our results will look something like this. After we are done with that, we can move on to actually using Amy Dick, which will, like I said, convert our Sparkle output into our validated format. We can, of course, run help for Amy Dick as well. And after we have done that, we can convert our Sparkle endpoint using this particular query. And here we have to specify what are the terms we actually require in our country dictionary. And after we've done that, our results will look something like this on the Jupyter command line. Then we quickly validate our dictionary so that we know that it will work well for our, for our Amy search. And this is what the results would look like, and our search would be validated. So this is about dictionaries as well as the corpus. Now we move on to another notebook, which is about how we can actually use Amy to get useful inferences from, from our Jupyter, within our Jupyter notebook. So um, Amy will be using, we will be here in this demo, I'll be using multiple dictionaries. I showed you how to make a country dictionary. On the similar line, we have already created eight different types of dictionaries. And among them, I'm going to be using three dictionaries, the country dictionary, the drug dictionary, and the diseases dictionary. All dictionaries are available on our open virus page. And here is the link to that. So now I quickly run the Amy search after specifying the variables. The output directory would be the same as the one we used for our get paper search. And I also specify the three dictionaries here. And uh, after we're done, our results would look something like this. And Amy will tell that it has created all the data tables for us. And moving on, this is what the a typical co-occurrence table or uh, would would look like. This is a S SVG file, and uh, we have already talked about this. But I'll I'll tell you how much more potential these frequency tables have. If we convert these tables into simple CSV files, and or they can be found here using this link. These CSV files can then be imported back into Jupyter and um, in, in the form of simple pandas data frames. For example, this one here, we have the countries and a number of diseases that are reported within these countries with the frequency for each country. For example, Australia reports influenza at, the, at uh, 51 papers from Australia in our corpus report influenza. We did a similar thing for the drug dictionary. Here are some very frequently reported drugs. For example, hydroxyquinine is, has been reported in 22 papers from Italy. Now, after we have done that, let's. Uh, here is a few, very quick inference. The commonest country was United States. That is, it is bringing out more papers than other countries. Rep the commonly reported disease is influenza, and the commonest drug is hydroxychloroquine. Keeping this in mind, we are going to move on to the actual inferences that we can see. This is a, uh, is a graph, or this is a Seaborn graph of um, how, the, how we can plot all our inferences in a very easily visualizable form. For example, like I told you, United States appears to be uh, publishing a lot of papers on drugs. For example, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, et cetera, are being used very frequently in the United States. And 
uh, uh, where other countries are also following suit. So next also, we can see that some of the diseases are more prominent in some countries than the others. But influenza seems to be topping the list, with it being reported in by most of the countries and at a much higher frequency than other diseases. And again, we can see that the USA has been bringing out more papers about the reports of influenza than any other country. So we also have attempted to plot it on the world map. And here is a world map which uh, shows uh, the usage of chloroquinine drug used in various countries. Now, if we click on any, any country, we can see uh, the frequency with which that drug is being used uh, in, with, within that country. And next, we have also tried to map the uh, actual report uh, of various drugs used in various countries. And this is a, a, you know, a list of all the countries that have been coming out and reporting diseases, uh, reporting various diseases that occurred in our corpora. So finally, we are going to write a quick code and th to thank Wikidata for lighting the world with the lamp of knowledge. And with this, I hand over to Ayush to tell you how our maps, how our inferences can be presented in a more in, in a more simplified way, which can be visualized in a single go. Thank you. Hello, I am Ayush Kirk, and today I'll be presenting and showcasing how we can um, visualize the data we get from scholarly papers and specifically how how we conclude the results from um, articles on viral epidemics. So let's first start with the occurrences of words in, um, in a paper. So what we do is all the papers, as you might have seen Ambreen say, are saved in a directory like this one. And it has basically all the files and sectioning done. I have run a code where we just have to specify the location and it will locate for all the files called results.xml, which is a standard. Are you can hear me? You yeah. have to show your slides now, okay? So now we can see your screen, okay? Okay. Uh, we are on the infinite screen. You have to go to your presentation, okay? Yeah. Um, I have started. You can go. OK, so I was saying that first, let us look at the occurrences of words in research articles and try to see what we can make out of them. As you might have seen, Ambrine say we save all the files which we um, get from papers into our local machine. So I have saved them in test data to run this dictionary uh, to run this Jupyter notebook. You just need to change the location. But what we are actually doing is we are going to this folder and we are searching for every results.xml file. Now I've I've created a list out of them, and then we create um, then we change this into a um, into a Python data frame, which you can basically imagine as an Excel spreadsheet. Now, as as you can as you can imagine, in a research paper there might be words like is, am, um, are, the words like these. So I just remove the stop words. And then I plot basic graphs like this one. So as we can see in a particular paper, influenza is mentioned 160 times, um, data is mentioned 60 times, and so on. Now this is just the visualization. But in the back end, what we are actually doing is we are taking this result and we are taking a dictionary as well. So for example, the dictionary has the word influenza and this paper also has the word influenza. When these two correlate, there will be one hit. And we repeat the process for every word in the research paper along with every word in every dictionary, which leads us to a very valuable information set. Um, so now I'm going to show you how we can take that gigantic information set and make it presentable to the end user. So, um, as Amtrain said, we saved the files into CSV format, and I'm just loading these into Python. Also, this dictionary is also self-sufficient, and it creates all the files it needs itself. 
So we started from this. And after running the Jupyter notebook, we have something like this. These all files are created by the notebook itself. So we create the index.html and all the files we need. And then we start plotting the graphs. This one you might have seen earlier. This is the same of um, Andrean. These are just bar graphs for the information we had. This simplifies um, the data set to a lot of degree, but I think we can improve further. So moving down, uh, I've taken the concept of plotting on world maps and I've increased it up a notch. Every graph and every world map that you see is saved in the test uh, and is saved in the working directory. So whenever you have to reference it, you can just you don't have to run the notebook again. You can just visit it from um, from the folder. Now I have saved all these world maps. And I've just printed um, the data frames. Now the thing is, if we are seeing all of these in just a folder, it still becomes very cumbersome to locate each one of them. Now to improve this, I have created a dashboard which gets created from these files only. Um, the the notebook only creates this, and it has everything in a very presentable form in the form of an HTML website. Now this is a bit advanced disease plot. So let's say, let me click on China. We are presented with a table with the country named China, along with the diseases, um, basically the papers um, for which we got the disease hits. So we got 273 hits for influenza. Uh, for measles, we got 38 and so on. Moving down further, we have represented the information in the same bar graph. And we've done the same for drugs also. Now this is a very useful. Um, this is a very useful graph because from from just the papers we were able to see how influenza is measured um, for the whole world. So the radius of these circles represent the number of hits that our papers got from that particular country. United States circle is the biggest followed by China, then Japan, Italy, and so on. I've also plotted the drugs on the map. So if I click on, let's say China, the top searches are hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. As you might know, these drugs are, are being tested um, to be used for treatment of the coronavirus. So it was obvious that papers having mentions of these drugs will go out and we will able to catch this valuable information. Now, I know there are a lot of things we have to fix, but this project truly showcases the power of code we have in the 21st century, along with the significance of open source as well as open access that makes projects like these possible. There are more than 100 million research papers in the world. Imagine if every one of them is open access, what change can we bring and what diseases can we prevent? Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ayush. Now it's time for Ariana. I'll let her join here in a second. Hi, Ariana, you're live here with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going you to share You can share my your screen, screen and start your presentation, OK? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, great. Can you hear me? Just please confirm. Yes, we can hear you and see your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you very much, uh, all the team. There's a lot of talent in this team. I, it's a uh, really exciting project. Thank you so much, Peter Moray, to invite us to be part of this uh, 
incredible demonstration that uh, Global South collaboration can achieve wonderful results and that multilingual also uh, is possible. So uh, just to continue demonstrating this, I'm going to make my presentation in Spanish. Eh, así que muchas gracias. Mi nombre es Ariana Becerril y yo estoy a cargo de la Dirección de, de Tecnología de, eh, y de Innovación de Redalic. Y el día de hoy eh, voy a platicar un poco sobre qué es Redalic en ocho minutos, por qué surge y cuál es el interés de eh, participar en, en el proyecto eh, de, de Open Virus y particularmente eh, con la información de, Wiki, de Wikidata. Nosotros estamos convencidos que hay una, eh, una fragmentación de nuestro sistema de comunicación científica mundial, donde vemos eh, eh, una fragmentación de lo que se publica en el norte versus lo que se publica en el sur, una ciencia que se conoce como de corriente principal versus otra que se considera periférica, que normalmente es la que se produce en el y no necesariamente porque no está en los eh, en los circuitos de eh, tradicionales de comunicación científica del norte eh, llámese las bases de datos que se le conocen como de corriente principal y también hay una fragmentación de lo comercial versus lo no comercial dado que los países que trabajamos en el sur normalmente lo hacemos bajo un modelo no comercial entonces, eh, estamos convencidos que la ciencia debe ser una conversación equitativa, participativa y global, en donde hay que pensar cómo se tiene que insertar el sur global en, esta, eh, eh, en este panorama donde eh, se están transfiriendo las, eh, eh, las restricciones de publicar hacia la lectura con los y toda la transición a los eh, APS, sobre todo. En ese sentido, América Latina ha mantenido un sistema no comercial de publicación científica donde las instituciones académicas eh, tienen revistas científicas, las corren con sus eh, propios eh, elementos, sus, sus estudiantes, sus profesores, y no hay cuotas ni para autores ni para revisores. Es un enfoque de ciencia como un bien público, donde no haya PCs, donde hay eh, acceso abierto inmediato, donde se favorece la inclusión, la diversidad, el, el, las lenguas locales y es un eh, el modelo manejado por la academia, en que está en control y en manos de la academia, donde hay un, af, una fuerte inversión eh, pública, de dinero público, y donde hay un, un beneficio universal. Eh, eso aunado a que tenemos ahora tecnologías que nos habilitan un escenario con realmente un potencial para, para poder eh, reescribir las formas tradicionales de comunicación científica, alejarlas del circuito comercial, que es las que termina causando restricciones hacia nuestros países, y hay otras posibilidades para que modelos como el que estamos mostrando hoy sean posibles. El modelo Redalic eh, defiende que, se haya, que, que sea el acceso abierto inmediato, no comercial, no APC, sin fines de lucro, apalancado por la tecnología y eh, propiedad de la academia. Es una infraestructura de servicios que permite eh, ayudar a las revistas científicas que ya son editadas en América Latina y dotarlas de diferentes eh, valores agregados para poder, eh, para permitir que esa revista sea sostenible, que sea, se pueda hacer a bajo costo, que pueda ser comunicada eh, en múltiples idiomas y que pueda ser sobre todo eh, conectada con otras fuentes de información debido a las tecnologías con las cuales se editan este tipo de eh, las revistas que indexa Redalic. En ese sentido, eh, probemos un conjunto de servicios. Estos son nuestros números, eh, poco más de 1.300 revistas indexadas en full text, casi un millón de artículos científicos de 670 instituciones editoras de 31 países. Eh, dando acceso abierto al texto completo. Eh, estamos atendiendo a poco más de 60 mil eh, usuarios que descargan eh, artículos dentro de la plataforma, artículos que no se cobran por publicar eh, eh, y tampoco se cobran por leer. Es acceso abierto orgánico en ese sentido. Eh, la arquitectura de nuestro proyecto eh, se basa en una capa de calidad que lo que hace es filtrar y asegurarse que las revistas que ingresan a la plataforma que provienen de universidades eh, tienen o cumplen con criterios de calidad y un proceso riguroso de selección para poder ser indexadas en la plataforma una vez que 
eh, se supera esta, este proceso, les eh, ofrecemos un conjunto de herramientas y tecnología para la eficiencia y la sostenibilidad de estas revistas, para que no cobren por public publicar y por supuesto sigan siendo de open access. Entonces, nosotros eh, hemos desarrollado un conjunto de herramientas eh, basadas en el XML para obtener de manera automática eh, diferentes formatos de lectura como el PDF, HTML, EPUF, eh, diferentes eh, lectores de artículos científicos que son totalmente libres, gratuitos para descarga y los editores se apoyan de esa tecnología para minimizar sus costos de producción. Después tenemos diferentes eh, 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 servicios de recuperación de información, de interoperabilidad, de visibilidad, también de métricas. Estamos preocupados por ayudar a encontrar otras formas de valorar la ciencia y en este sentido ofrecemos un conjunto de, de, de métricas y otras formas eh, que representan en mapas la cartografía de cómo se teje la ciencia y servicios semánticos a través de eh, ontologías, link open data y, y, y otros más. Eh, estos son los formatos que generamos de manera automática para las revistas científicas, ya que nosotros creemos que debe haber visibilidad orgánica, debemos buscar el descubrimiento y el impacto eh, de manera orgánica, eh, con, difundiendo o conectando cada pequeño elemento que compone un artículo científico, en este caso estamos abocados a los artículos científicos, para que sea una pieza de, eh, de información en un, en, en, un, eh, en un grafo colectivo que podamos crear compartiendo datos, etiquetando datos y ahora con este proyecto de Open Virus poder eh, descubrir el conocimiento en eh, epidemias virales, por ejemplo, ¿no? Para ser parte de esta estructura que, que exprese el tejido eh, inherente eh, dentro del conocimiento científico y poder lograr esa visibilidad y seguir siendo... Eh, seguir eh, ayudando a las revistas científicas y a la comunicación científica a mantenerse del lado no comercial. Eh, de esa manera vamos a poder lograr que nuestros países puedan tener una participación más equitativa, que nuestros idiomas también puedan tener una participación mucho más eh, justa en, esta, en este panorama de la comunicación científica. Muchas gracias a todo el equipo y esperamos seguir colaborando ampliamente con eh, el equipo de desarrolladores, que de verdad los felicito, y con eh, el doctor Peter Murray para poder lograr muchos mayores avances conectando la eh, literatura científica en español a este proyecto. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ariana. That was awesome. Really like to hear Spanish is good for the years for us. Uh, and now we have... Ranjan. So you look, we would like to thank uh, Red Link team for providing a Spanish corpus. And this is the Spanish corpus, which is provided by the Red Link team, which is Europe EMC. And this corpus is nearly 200 papers. After building like Spanish dictionary, we were using we are using any search terms in this corpus. So I'll be showing in this how it worked and like we could find the better results here too. So we have created a, a ex, exclusive Spanish language query for the drug dictionary using Sparkle query. So you I could find here there like this is being like the as I said earlier the instance of medications and the molecular formula and we keep and Spanish link have been used and their labels as well. So it takes like nearly half a minute and we got results of 1570 results here after using this, after running this query. So this is a typically output of uh, Sparkle output looks like, which has been like added here, like a screenshot of it. So please have a look into it. So once this output is ready and we directly give it into the MEDIC format, which how this looks like, which directly turns into any format for running a search call run a search in a particular corpus of particular dictionary into it. So you could find here the term like have been just given a show. Uh, see here, like you could find it has its own a uh, unique identifier term and a picture and formula with their Wikipedia links as well. So this here comes. So as I shown you the corpus, so this, it, this after running any search, we found that like this in that corpus, which we had like drug uh, interaction of this corpus, these were the results we shown in the corpus of drug. So here, 
So we ran a search on which is both in, into drug and diseases. So here's the co-occurrence table of that Spanish corpus of Spanish terms into it. So you could find these are the uh, so these are the terms which have been these are the drugs and these are the diseases being mentioned in the top results which have been mentioned in those corpus. So here, so these here comes the uh, drugs in Rendelic corpus and their uh, indication which have been taken from the wiki data. So these are the few drugs which have been like top drugs which have been like uh, given the uses for where it have been used and like for treat which diseases. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, okay. it's up to you now. Your presentation is here and you're good to go. Okay, thank you, uh, Vicky and also uh, Peter and Erica and all the Vicky side team that uh, invite me to talk in this uh, event. So my talk is about towards resilience in academic publishing and more with open science. Uh, I can see I must be the the only geologist in the room right now. <laughs> Usually that happens. So uh, three years ago with some colleagues, I started the in archive hosted by COIS. Uh, and then it gained much attention. We've got more than uh, 10K submissions in three years of operations. In early 2020, we decided to leave uh, COS due to funding requirements that we cannot fulfill. Then in May 21st, 2020, Indonesia Science Institute or LIPI offered us to host the preprint brand under the new name Rain Archive. It's now operated using uh, the open preprint system created by public knowledge projects. So if you see my picture here, um, this is us, right, doing some science, and then this is uh, an X-ray to see the internal organs. So, uh, in in the case of Indonesia and most of the global South country, uh, apparently we can make this X-ray machine our own, but we still spend money to buy commercial products, the same X-ray, right, and then if we see the internal organs here we have heart lungs i i make an analogy here we have op we should have open infrastructure community led human rights and then uh, human rights to study human rights to le learn to read right? and then open data peer, open peer review open dissemination and and other so if this is our body, right? If you need to get healthy, you need to do some physical activities, right? Eat good stuff, have enough rest, yeah? Uh, just do that and you don't have to buy expensive trainers, right? expensive gym, just get a pair of sneakers, any sneakers and then just run. So that way we can we can maintain our resilience to, to keep our body healthy. And then we can scale up this model to university to research institution to national level so in these days too many experts have influenced the mind of policymakers at university and national level they say some of citations some of patterns are the true signs of innovations it said that both indicators will drive innovation to move faster but this tragedy has driven our uh, higher education to set up a higher cost system Right, Indonesia pay, uh, I think about fifteen uh, billion rupiah or one million US dollar equivalent to pay access to a commercial database, uh, averagely. On top of that, we have also several university pay for the same uh, service, so it's kind of double, double uh, spending, right? 
uh, all of those uh, are public money. So public money has been poured to support corporations with less role as stakeholders. Instead, they are more of the instrument of shareholders. We can see in this case, uh, in this plan to make a one nation, one subscription plan, you can uh, click the link here. And also, of course, Max, Max Planck case. And also Indonesian case soon will be published. We, uh, I write uh, an article in the, the conversation with some colleagues and it will be published soon. With that said, <coughs> uh, researchers, funders, policymakers are now forgetting the true spirit of science as public goods or science with less conflict of interest, science of for broader community, science as subject of scrutiny and reusable science and also affordable science, of course. Hence, at this point, we as scientists are very much dependent on commercial products, right? We need to move forward to uh, towards resilience in academic publishing and much more by applying open science principle. Uh, notice I write open with bracket. Uh, I mean that uh, open is it's not, it's not, uh, doesn't have to be written, right? Science uh, supposed to be open. Right. Wikimedia, on the other hand, has promoted those energies along with inclusion, equity, and diversity. With its values, Wikimedia definitely can help scientific development in the global south. Of course, uh, a little more friendlier, uh, friendlier environment with, within the Wikimedia or Wikipedia environment is very much needed for new users, especially for non-computing persons like like myself, like like geologists, common geologists, right? So this is just to remind us how we uh, we deal with this situation. This is the uh, Max Planck and Springer Nature Open Access deal. We can see that Peter Super here say they pay high rejection rate. Yeah, they're not paying about higher the, the, the discoverability, higher visibility, but they pay high rejection rate. And then of, of course, Peter, uh, said publishing is equals to getting an accolade, right? And this is the, the, the Max Planck people uh, gather up in one side, and this is the uh, researchers from the rest of the world waiting in line. And also we have this uh, issue in, in our SE impact blog stating that open access uh, as a whole, built a whole new market, right? And then we, they put up another another wall. Instead of only have this pay wall, we have also APC wall uh, uh, on the side. Of course, uh, this model is cannot be. Uh, it's not sustainable, right? Uh, it's not affordable and it's not sustainable. So we need to move forward from this state. Thank you, Erica. That's all from me. Thank you. Now we go back to Peter. So, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I, there's an echo somewhere. Uh, but I wanted to hand over to Daniel, if Daniel is around. I don't have anything to say other than we must now work with Wikimedia to take this forward. Uh, so this is a five minutes to see where the future lies. So Daniel is here with us. Hi, Daniel. Glad that you can make it. Uh, uh, it wasn't entirely planned this way, but yeah, I, I, I just cobbled together some notes. I put the notes into uh, the YouTube chat, but I seem to be kind of censored by the YouTube chat. Most of my comments don't get through. Um, and now I'm trying to share my screen. Um, so that we can look over those notes together. Uh, it's not much. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I shared the link to that notebook. It sits on pause, so it's public. Um, in, uh, so there is a public version of it here. Maybe I should use the public version right away. Um, so some things that came to my mind when uh, I read Peter's um, idea that this um, set of comments at the end of this session should be about how to link the efforts of the open content mine or open virus slash content mine 
team to Scolia and the Wikimedia ecosystem more broadly. So let's start with Scolia. So uh, for, for Scolia, we actually have a template that can be put on to wiki pages, like Wikipedia pages, um, in order to link from the Wikipedia page to um, Scolia. And um, yeah, so I, I put in, a, in an example. So this is the English version of that template. It is in use on a number of articles, for instance, about the Zika virus. And here I uh, just display an example how it is used on the Serbian Wikipedia. And this template can be made aware of the different aspects that Scolia has. So uh, that here we see it's a topic profile. Um, and we can have, which is actually wrong because uh, this person here, uh, is, it's a person. It should have been an author profile, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, but uh, we, we can figure this out. And so if we want, we can link specifically to a topic profile or to a person profile or to the profile of a chemical or a drug or some or a disease. Um, but the point is that anything that um, the content mine pipeline identifies, um, if there is a representation of it on Wikidata, then we can link to the Scolia profile for that. The, the Scolia profile might not always be useful because maybe that um, item is not very well annotated yet, or we get the classes wrong as in this example. But at least the uh, principal possibility of linking is there. Um, th if you want to find out more about how this template is used, there is a, um, a page on Wikidata that keeps track of them. Another thing to consider uh, in terms of linking to Scolia is that we can do redirects. So if you look at this URL, I'll increase my um, screen size a little bit. Uh, so this URL here, uh, it basically, whoops. Um, it's scolia.toolforge.org, then some sort of a, um, an identifier for a, an identifier system. So here, this is DOI. And then I just put a DOI that I happen to have for a paper. And if I click that, I end up on the Scolia profile for the paper that has that DOI. Let's see that. So here we have it on, in the URL. Sometimes it's slow, especially when I'm live broadcasting. Uh, so here we go, we end up on that paper. So if Wikidata knows that paper and knows the DOI for it, then uh, Scolia will be able to show you the uh, profile for that. Uh, that's one thing. And Scolia can do redirects with a number of things for chemicals and uh, for papers and uh, for people and organizations. Um, as long as the uh, URL formatter for uh, like the DOI here, is set properly for which there is a dedicated property. Um, these redirects, they are a bit brittle, uh, like for instance, uh, for things like Twitter handles or um, DOIs, there might be problems with uppercase, lowercase things, but that's not a big problem that can be relatively easily fixed. Then uh, another thing to consider, there is actually a tool that is much more powerful in terms of redirecting because it can handle all Wikidata properties. Scolia just handles a subset of it, maybe uh, a few dozens, um, but uh, there's the Wikidata Hub, which can handle essentially all Wikidata properties. Plus, it can redirect to a number of external sites, uh, so you can uh, use something like a DOI and then point to some sort of, uh, something like a Wikipedia article or something like that. Um, but you can also point to Scolia. So you could use the Wikidata Hub to uh, point to Scolia based on a DOI. So again, P356 is a DOI, and then I just put in the, that identifier, and then I will end up on the page for that paper. Uh, it should be the same paper as in the previous example, because I just used the same DOI for both examples. So you see here, and site equals Scolia, and then here we go. <clears throat> That's how th this uh, redirecting works. Then uh, some other thoughts. OK, you see here I had some markdown uh, that wasn't properly formatted. So um, the uh, JADS format in which the articles are available from PubMed uh, that content mine is mining um, is not currently indexed in Wikidata. So maybe we should think about a dedicated Wikidata property so that we can then reuse all the uh, JADS tags um, in uh, our pipeline and uh, be better informed about. Uh, because in JADS, things like external identifiers for a gene or a protein or so they might already be present, or uh, also the UI. And then if that is already present, that facilitates the mining, and uh, Wikidata could help with that. And 
doing this would actually help uh, kind of closing the loop uh, because um, one of the reasons why we started Wikisite is that we had a bot called Open Access Media Importer Bot um, that um, was uh, working on um, uploading image files or audio and video files from the scholarly literature onto Wikimedia Commons. And uh, it needed to keep track of um, which articles it had uploaded files for to Wikimedia Commons. And so, uh, of course, we had an internal way of keeping track of that, but uh, it would have been nice to do that more in public, uh, which is why we started uh, Wikiproject source metadata on Wikidata, which is one of the main components of Wikisite. Uh, so um, these are just some thoughts here uh, that came to my mind when I <laughs> Kind of learned that I was to speak at this session, which I, uh, which was uh, just last, last night. So thanks for the attention. I'm happy to dig deeper uh, into any of that, and I'm very glad that the uh, content mine team is getting more closely interactive with Wikidata. Thanks. So Peter, do you want to wrap it up? Do you want to go to a discussion, see what's going on on the other pad? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, well, uh, I was aiming for um, uh, 1320 UTC because I think you said you had something else on, but I'm more than happy to discuss if there's time for it. Yes, I think we can go for more 10 minutes. Well, that's, that's brilliant. So I am here um, to try and uh, bring people together, as I think we have seen in uh, this meeting. Uh, and the key thing, I think, is that you now have many more people that you know that you can talk to. For me, I think the thing that I would like to see is I'd like to see um, Global South publication integrated with Wikimedia uh, and content mine tools to make it better than the rest of the world. This is the point. I mean, uh, Redelic should actually uh, be shown to the world as better than uh, the uh, Global North publishers who are terrible. Similarly, uh, we can um, add uh, the values of the world, uh, that is uh, multilinguality and uh, inclusion and equity, to this so we should start from the values and then decide uh you know what we want to do my feeling is that we are just starting so that what we uh will need to do is meet up again and um address address this i think it would be great to have a um a meeting on uh what scholia can do and what we can provide for scholia um because these are proofs of concept they're not finished products. Yes, Peter, I totally agree. Uh, here in Brazil, we started to explore Scolia this year, and we have what we call Wikidata Labs, which are technical trainings on Wikidata tools, and we explore uh, Scolia, Zotero, and other tools related to it, and I think we can work on a workshop together and see what the Global South have to offer to it as well. And Wikimedia platforms are very powerful in that sense, and we have to make use of them, right? It's difficult since other people aren't on this. I think I'm probably the only person who can speak. Um, I we can add whatever, we can add whoever wants to talk here. Um, I would, probably like to hear uh, a little bit more from uh, both um, uh, Dasapta and Ariana as to uh, where they would see this going because they are producing high quality content to feed into uh, potentially um, indexing and aggregation by um, uh, Wikidata Content Mine and Scholia. Uh, we have here with us 
Diraj, Umbrin, Daniel, Aurora, Ayush, and Jonathan. Uh, okay, well, uh, maybe uh, Jonathan, uh, who works with um, uh, Jonathan, works with um, uh, Ariana, and Jonathan is uh, uh, his natural language is Spanish, so maybe you know he can um, uh, say a few words. Hello, I'm Jonathan. Uh, yes, I can share you some some words while well in my uh, native language. Yeah, eh, es, es importante, bueno, pues es la colaboración que nosotros eh, hemos estado teniendo con, con ustedes. Eh, la forma en que nosotros podemos eh, compartir, bueno, que nosotros podamos de cierta forma eh, pues digamos introducir bueno pues nuestra información poderla compartir la forma en que la puede se pueda indexar y el, el propósito de pues obtener eh, cierto conocimiento que bueno que puede ser pues útil aquí realizando un análisis y descubrir lo que nos lo que bueno que podríamos eh, entender no sé bueno acerca de todo lo que es eh, nuestro contenido nuestro corpus que habla acerca de de revista social, de, bueno, que en materia social, eh, en áreas incluso, bueno, que también compartimos de medicina, salud, que, bueno, es lo que estamos viendo ahorita en, en Open Virus, y pues es interesante ver qué es lo que podríamos descubrir, ofrecer en lo que es eh, todo lo, el contenido de revistas que contienen artículos en español y que, pues, nosotros eh, podamos proveer y aportar a, a, bueno, a todo lo que es este medio en sobre, sobre, bueno, sobre lo que estamos trabajando. Eh, bueno, <ríe> eso, <ríe> bueno, eso sería eh, eh, acerca de lo que puedo aportar. Y bueno, que bueno, también agregar, bueno, ya por último, que pues lo que estamos trabajando, lo que es este, pues no, en nuestra base de todo nuestro conocimiento es, es sobre el, el formato XML JATS. Entonces, todos los artículos que nosotros tenemos, eh, pues los trabajamos sobre eso. De, de esta forma, nosotros podemos eh, generar lo que, bueno, a, a Ariana en su momento explicó acerca de la visualización, los visores que tenemos. Y bueno, pues tienen este formato que a ustedes les sirve como entrada, pues también que puedan este, utilizarlo y bueno, y extraer este tipo de conocimiento para el proyecto. Y bueno, eh, sería todo. <ríe> Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. This was a great insight of this work that you've been doing with Ariana and it has everything to do what we've presented here on this session. So the idea was to bring these global soft voices and we obviously have a lot of work to do and hopefully we can do this together so we can actually bring up this global soft perspective and these uh, citations and annotations uh, to a more broad audience, right? And using the Wikimedia platforms as well. So I think that now Celio wants to show what's going on on the other pad. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I do suggest you, you all to look at our other pad. Uh, I inserted the link uh, below at the presentation. You can see it right now. And I'm at this screen share, I'm showing you some questions that were made. Uh, some of them were already answered, but it's always a good idea to take a look at uh, every single question. For instance, we have um, two questions here for Dirish, um, about talking about the weak data sparkle and multilinguality. Uh, Nicolas Vigneron made a, a comment about trying to use magic words for that. Uh, then Jean Hales, for instance, replied uh, asking if they are already uh, in the parser, do they replace it by a template, for instance? 
there are also a question for Ariana. Como se, um, how would work uh, a new mechanism uh, more use more diverse, trying to define uh, impact factor, for instance. So again, uh, I do ask you all to look at the etherpad, uh, comment, answer, uh, make more questions. That's the idea. Hola, ¿me escuchan? Yes. Ah, thank you. I, I uh, heard that it's a question for me. Sorry, but I had a little bit trouble with the, with the stream yard. Yes, we have one question for you, Ariana, that is, ¿Cómo debería funcionar un mecanismo más diverso para orientar cómo medimos factor de impacto? Creo que este factor importa y mucho con el modo como se establece esa separación tan dura entre norte y sur que has presentado, en especial para el modo como influencia las estrategias de las, los investigadores. Eh, gracias por su trabajo, una verdadera inspiración. Muchas gracias. Creo que contesto en español. Eh, Nosotros estamos trabajando para mostrar que hay otras formas eh, mucho más orgánicas y naturales, no solamente de diseminar la, la información científica, sino también de cualificarla. Es decir, eh, el factor de impacto está basado en servicios comerciales que normalmente excluyen a los países del sur, como los nuestros. ¿Por qué no tenemos los recursos para participar en, este, en estos circuitos? Nosotros creemos que si conectamos el conocimiento, eh, por eso hacemos uso del XML y ads, y si conectamos cada elemento de información, entonces podemos mostrar cómo se crean colegios invisibles, cómo se crean redes, quién es quién en ciertas temáticas, dependiendo de cómo se entreteje el conocimiento de manera inherente, de manera natural. Todo esto lo hacemos con el uso eh, de, de, de RDF y de, y, de, y de otros formatos que nos permiten conectar elementos. Para nosotros participar en eh, eh, ahora en este proyecto, hacer uso de Wikidata y, y, y todos estos diccionarios nos permite realmente llevar el conocimiento científico producido en el sur, particularmente en América Latina, a otras instancias. Y eso es lo que creemos que nos va a permitir ir más allá del factor de impacto, mostrar mapas y la cartografía y los grafos que, que representan el conocimiento y quién está detrás de ello. Thank you, Ariana. That was awesome. Uh, I think we can wrap it up with this last question here. Uh, this one says, I must say I admire the work that is done, amazing, but how do we make it scalable? One challenge I see is coding, and it's dirty and confusing for simple queries. How should we improve this? Another challenge I see is the existence of proprietary science technologies and databases. What are the limits you encounter in your strategies that relate to this challenge? Lastly, multilingualism is still a challenge, I guess. You are finding ways to overcome this, but what are the obstacles that this still represents? Thanks. So these are a lot of questions, I know, but feel free to answer however you feel suitable here. And this one goes to the Open Virus team. So can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. This is an excellent question. Um, I think, first of all, that Wikimedia has shown that it is very good at scaling. It starts off with prototypes. 
uh, and then it brings in more experts uh, so that things become more robust. So um, there are I, probably 200 languages used in um, Wikimedia regularly, and I think we can find experts in those who will help us carry out the uh, language scaling. Um, support for written language in Unicode has got a lot better over the last uh, 15 years. So I think we can see, um, uh, you know, that we have fewer problems with diacritics and normalization than we used to have. Um, that's from the technical point of view. But I am just an optimist. I believe that if you bring committed people together, they will solve it. So I think this will be solved. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Sally, do you want to add anything else? No, uh, j just uh, remembering that Etherpad will keep running, so people will be able to answer this oh, at least the entire day. So please, uh, the Etherpad has uh, an advice. <laughs> to make a copy of all the import, important information, but uh, we, we can continue using it uh, at least along the day. It's a, it will be a, an amazing platform to keep things running uh, just after we end this section. Okay, so I think we can wrap it up here. So you guys know that Etherpad is still available. You can reach out the Open Virus team, Ariana as well, and Daniel. They're all available. You have their contacts. You can also contact us from Wikimovement Brasil. Celio and I will be available here. And finally, I just want to say thank you again to all the speakers that got involved in this session. It was amazing. It was even better than we expected because we really got got into this objective to reach out to Global South Voices. And I think we have still a lot of work to do, but it's nice to know that we are doing this in good company as well. So I think we can wrap it up here. Peter, do you want to say anything else? I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and to remind people uh, that this is uh, recorded. Uh, so there will be many more people who can see this. I'm so pleased that everybody was able to showcase what they've been doing, what their ideas are, what challenging they're taking. And I would expect this to become quite an important repeated video for people who care about the Global South and its um, uh, opportunity to communicate with the world. Yes, that's the spirit, Peter. So yeah. thank you guys and we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.